All right, good evening. My name is David Fields and I am the Associate Director of the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome to the third event in our Midwestern Professionalization Seminar in East Asian Studies. This seminar is a collaboration between the UW Center for East Asian Studies and the Ohio State University. I wanna thank my colleagues at OSU, including Mitch Lerner, who is the director there, and Stephanie Metzger for making this event possible, as well as our own Lori Dennis. Today's event will help students interested in East Asian studies explore careers in journalism. And we have an excellent panel to help us do this. If you are attending this event, it is likely that you will be interested in the last event in this series on careers in the policy world. And I will post a link to that event in the chat, or you can find a link to it on our website, eastasia.wisc.edu. For today's event, I will briefly introduce our panelists, and I will be keeping my introductions very brief since we'll be hearing a great deal about their careers over the next hour or so. And then I will get us started by asking them just a few questions. And then after 30 minutes or so, we will take questions from those in attendance. If you have questions, please feel free to submit them at any time via the Q&A function that Zoom provides. We have three excellent panelists today, starting with Jonathan Chang. Jonathan Chang is the China Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal, where he oversees a team of more than two dozen correspondents and researchers in Beijing and Shanghai, with responsibility for the Chinese mainland and Taiwan. Previously, Jonathan was the, was the sole bureau chief for the journal. He began his career as an intern in the journal's Hong Kong bureau and has also worked as a markets reporter for the journal's New York office. He is currently working on a book length manuscript on the topic of North Korea and Christianity. And he graduated from Princeton University with a degree in history. Our second panelist, Mike Chinoy, is a non-resident fellow at the US-China Institute at the University of Southern California and the creator of Assignment China, a documentary series on the history of American journalism and journalists in China. Before joining USC in 2006, Mike spent 24 years as a foreign correspondent for CNN, serving as the network's first bureau chief in Beijing and then in Hong Kong and as the senior Asia correspondent. He has covered Asia broadly since the 1970s, and he is the author of four books, including China Live, People, Power, and Television, and Meltdown, the Inside Story of the North Korean Nuclear Crisis. He holds a BA from Yale and an MS from Columbia University. And our third panelist is Elizabeth Shim. Elizabeth is the chief Asia writer for United Press International. She focuses on the Korean Peninsula and is the author of North Korea's Nuclear Cinema, which is forthcoming from Bloomsbury. She was a 2015-2016 CSIS USC US Korea Next Generation Scholar and a former reporter for the Associated Press in Seoul. Shim earned a master's, a joint master's degree in global journalism and East Asian studies at NYU and is a graduate of Wellesley College. I want to thank each of you for joining us this evening or this morning, as is the case for some of you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to explore uh, your path into journalism, what being a journalist covering East Asia is like. And so I would just like to start by just asking each of you a, a very simple question, which is why East Asia and why journalism? Why did you get interested in East Asia? And why did you why did you choose journalism as as a career? Or maybe it happened the other way around. And um, I was thinking maybe if we could hear from Elizabeth and then Mike and then Jonathan on this question. So please, Elizabeth. Thank you, David, for those excellent introductions. Um, I see journalism's highest duty is to grasp and articulate its own time. It, it strives for a better politics um, by holding people in power accountable for their words and deeds. Um, I focus on Korea as a journalist because, and this is important for all of you, you know, charting your, your path. The goal of 
our journey after school, after graduation, is to is to find our center. Um, so that requires cutting out the white noise of what others want you to do, what you think you should do for possibly financial reasons. But obviously, you need to balance the pragmatic as well. But if if you're someone who just like the idea of working at the intersection of journalism in East Asia and telling the stories of East Asia, then this is the occupation for you. I didn't start out as a journalist. I worked in investment banking uh, and then switched to magazine editing in Seoul in my late 20s. I attended graduate school at NYU, like David said, and I've been at the same organization pretty much since graduation. Um, and working at this intersection has, has enabled myself to build upon my graduate school experience, especially in, in East Asian studies. So um, what I've done is while, you know, keeping my day job as a journalist, I've continued you know, my, my habit of attending academic conferences long after graduation, uh, which helped me synthesize uh, my ideas for books uh, beyond beyond the activities of the newsroom. So working at this intersection has given me to pursue unique projects I would never have pursued if I worked on the business side of media. Uh, so I would say if you have interesting ideas and you're interested in East Asia, then, then work at this intersection. It's an important one, especially for our times. If, if you want to write a book, um, you know, obtaining a book contract from a major publisher is not an easy feat for, for novice authors. But like I said, if you, you know, if you focus on your core competencies, um, you will achieve, you know, some major goals you might have. And if, if that, if East Asian journalism is the right niche for you, I say go for it. Thank you for that, uh, Elizabeth. Um, Mike, how about you? Why, why East Asia and, and why journalism? Well, I, I, this is gonna date me. I feel like a bit of a dinosaur here, but I got interested in China uh, uh, because essentially I was a product of the Vietnam War generation in the States. I grew up in the late, late 60s and early 70s um, and was interested in China because as part of my trying to understand why the US was fighting in Vietnam, a lot of the discussion came back to, we were trying to counter the bad communists in uh, China. And so that got me interested in China and Chinese. And I started studying Chinese and I was very lucky to be able to get on one of the very first trips to China uh, after the Nixon uh, visit in 1972. I made my first trip to China in 73 with a student group. Uh, and then after I did a, uh, um, a master's degree in journalism uh, at Columbia because I sort of knew something about China, but not very much about journalism. Uh, I moved to Hong Kong, which is where I'm actually uh, based at the moment, despite this Irish landscape behind me in my Zoom picture. Uh, and I uh, arrived in Hong Kong at the end of 1975. Uh, and I was very lucky because 1976 turned out to be one of these cataclysmic news years in China. It started with the death of Premier Zhou Enlai. Uh, there was the first Tiananmen Square riot in April in which Deng Xiaoping was purged for a second time. There was the Tangshan earthquake, which killed a quarter of a million people, the death of Chairman Mao, and then the purging of Mao's widow, Zhang Qing, and the so-called radical gang of four. So I uh, was a real novice in journalism, but I hooked up as a radio stringer for CBS radio. Uh, and back then you couldn't go to China. So somebody who had some China grounding as I did had an opening uh, to sit in Hong Kong and try and make sense of what was going on across the border. And that was kind of how I got started. And I then ended up spending eight years uh, in Hong Kong and was lucky enough to be here at uh, first for CBS and then uh, was hired by NBC and was lucky enough to be here um, when China began to open up and the reform process first got started. So after the death of Mao, 77, 78, 79, 80, that period, it became possible to go to China on short uh, controlled visits, but at least the door was beginning uh, to open. And then when CNN was formed in 1983, I was hired as the fourth foreign correspondent 
for CNN. I was based in London as a kind of a fireman job that, you know, if something bad was happening in the world, put Mike on a plane and the foreign editor could sleep better at night. But it was always understood that whenever CNN was going to open a bureau in Beijing, that I would do so. And I finally got that opportunity in 1987. Uh, and spent eight years in Beijing and then a decade in Hong Kong. Um, so for me, the, the, the journalism uh, early on was a vehicle to uh, pursue an interest in China because back then in the 70s, when China wasn't open, it seemed like one of the few ways you could actually get to China was as a journalist. And that it took a lot longer than I anticipated, but that is essentially um, what happened. Um, I would echo what Elizabeth said that this is, is a fantastically interesting kind um, of work. I did it all together for almost for over 30 years. And then in 2006, I shifted gears, uh, left CNN, moved to the University of Southern California. Uh, largely, uh, I blame it on Kim Jong-il because I wanted to write a book about the North Korean nuclear crisis. And that realized I couldn't write a book and work for a 24 hour a day news uh, news organization. So I've since been in the kind of straddling the academic world. I, I follow events in China, but shifted to books and documentary uh, filmmaking. But for me, the journalism was a way to pursue an interest in China. And in the course of that, I kind of figured out how journalism itself worked. Thank you very much, Mike. And please don't feel like a dinosaur here. I think as, <laughs> as Mitch and I were thinking about this panel, it was, it was exciting to, to be able to bring you on. I, I know in the previous panels we've done, we've been trying to bring in people at, at various stages in their careers. So we get a lot of perspective on the, on the career that we're talking about. So uh, yeah, you're, you're, you should feel right at home here. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Jonathan, talk a little bit about your path. Sure. Although, actually, I might start by um, by just plugging Mike Chinoy's uh, documentary series, A Sign of China. Um, I watched it twice. I told Mike this. Um, I don't want. I don't have time to watch too many things, but I watched the entire documentary series twice, including the second time right before uh, deciding to come to Beijing to take this job. I mean, it's it, it's just a great um, look at the entire sweep of U.S.-China relations through the lens of journalism, through the lens of some of the big events over the last uh, 50 years, which, which of course Mike uh, has mentioned some of. So to put my, uh, my journey, I guess, in context, um, I guess I would have come to, to East Asia and journalism uh, more in the age of optimism when um, you know, China joined the WTO, the Olympics were coming up. That was the context in which um, I sort of came into this field, um, came out of college. Um, so for me, uh, it, it wasn't so much that I wanted to do East Asia and journalism. I knew I wanted to be a journalist. That I knew from the from from high school years. Uh, so, you know, I'm from Toronto, so I was I was uh, writing for a little newspaper in Toronto. I did some uh, work for the Star Ledger, in New Jersey. I would drive around and write for the Trentonian down in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, so, you know, I was I was thinking journalism would be like a U.S. sort of a thing. I almost took a job with the Miami Herald when I came out of college, and that would have led me down a different path entirely. Um, but I did have an interest in East Asia. I learned Chinese as a heritage language in college, um, and I started picking up some Korean after college, uh, just as a as a hobby. Um, and so. You know, one way or another, that led me to now uh, my third posting in Asia. So I've had four postings over my career, uh, one in New York, uh, writing about the stock market, nothing to do with Asia, but then the other three being in Hong Kong, in Seoul, and now in Beijing. So, um, you know, with every posting, I've had the conversation with my parents, obviously being of, of, of Asian descent, my parents are from Hong Kong. Um, there was always concern, and my dad would say to me, aren't you worried that you're going to be pigeonholed as the Asia guy at the Wall Street Journal? You know, they, they, they think, here's an Asian guy, let's put him in Asia. Um, to which, you know, my reply was, was pretty simple. I said, look, if, if Asia is a pigeonhole, then that's a pretty nice pigeonhole to have. It's half the world's people, once you throw in India and China alone, um, and arguably the most dynamic place in the world. That's my, that's my view. I mean, you look at, at at China, I mean, you don't need to explain the importance of China. That, we'll skip that. Um, Japan is still the world's number three economy, even though it hasn't been arguably dynamic for a while. But you know, you got some great stories coming out of Japan as well. And then Korea, where I spent six years, um, is great because you know, well, I mean, both both Elizabeth and Mike know um, we we've all had a lot of North Korea 
uh, in our in our resume and in our in our thoughts. But you know, it, it's a great place to be a journalist in a sense because it's um, about seventy five million people. Once you add North and South Korea together, it's not big in that respect, um, and it's not big in the sense that most. Western news organizations don't always have the budget to put someone in Seoul or put someone on the Korean Peninsula. But when the story gets hot, it is the hottest story in the world. And so it's a great place to get to know because it's often overlooked, I think, by the world until it isn't. And suddenly um, expertise is in demand. And so I kind of feel like like for the sort of the big three of Northeast Asia, uh, China, Japan, Korea, you don't really need to explain too much about that but of course i mean i haven't had experience in southeast asia or in um or in central asia or, or these other places but but you know it, it's a huge place to be and so um you know look at some point i i, I think i want to be outside of asia i do want to do something that's totally different maybe ireland <laughs> but you know um but but if if my entire career were to be asia that would not be a disappointment in any way for me so let me just stop there all right. Thank you. It, it's always interesting with these panels, how people end up where they are. And it seems like for Jonathan, you know, you knew right away or you knew really early what you wanted to do and then found East Asia where with Elizabeth and, and Mike, they, they kind of found their interest in East Asia and then found their way into journalism as a way to to pursue the kind of questions that they wanted to pursue. Um, so. In, in our audience today and in the audience that will be encountering this in the future as a part of our uh, programming on YouTube, are probably going to be a lot of both graduate students and undergraduate students who might be interested in how you get into this career. You know, how do you break in? How do you make that first contact or get that first internship? Um, and so I'm just wondering, in, in your opinion, what is something that a student who is interested in journalism, someone who's already working in East Asian studies, but they're, they're interested in journalism, what can they be doing right now to prepare for a career in journalism? What can they be doing right now to make themselves marketable and, and to, to stand out, to make themselves more marketable to get these kind of that first opportunity? And maybe, Jonathan, we could stick with you and then, um, oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe, no, that's right. Yes, Jonathan, if we could start with you and then maybe go to Mike and then Elizabeth. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll caveat it. I'm sure, I'm sure um, Mike and Elizabeth will say the same, but um, it's been, you know, 20 years since I was in college. So obviously the industry has changed a lot. Um, the internet did exist, but it wasn't obviously the way it is now. People were still mostly reading newspapers like this. Um, and, and I'll speak for newspapers because, you know, Mike will, will have a different perspective on Elizabeth as well. But, um, but, but for newspapers itself, which is what I wanted to do and, um, I mean, I knew I wanted to do it because as a kid, I was just reading the paper every day, mostly for the sports pages, but then it broadened and broadened and I just knew I wanted to be in newspapers. Uh, when I got to college, basically what I did and, and, and the advice that I would give, and I think it is still applicable today, is you just got to write as much as you possibly can. And so, um, so I, by the time I graduated from college, I probably had, um, I don't know, maybe 80 bylines to my name. Um, and that was between summer internships and freelancing as a student. Um, you know, I mentioned some of the papers that I wrote for. I mean, they weren't great papers. I mean, the Trentonian is like, you know, it, it's a full on tabloid, but for like a third tier city in the US. And so, um, you know, I would write about, you know, like um, drinking on the Princeton campus. I write about, you know, like, like, like sort of relatively sort of not terribly important stories. But I'd be writing stuff like that. And so, you know, when you're in college, before you are, you know, in your late 20s or something, and you're married, or you have a mortgage, or you have this or that, the best is to be able to write when you don't necessarily need to be making a ton of money. I know that's not true for everyone. Um, many people in college, I mean, it's, it, it's not, you know, it, it's not easy making ends meet, but you got to start somewhere. And you have this whole chicken and egg problem where um, a lot of organizations are going to be reluctant to hire you unless they can see you having written in a sort of real news context. Um, but how are you going to get that unless you start somewhere? And so a lot of the writing you're going to do at first is either going to be for nothing or close to nothing. And so that first that first summer I had, um, I was writing for an alt weekly in Toronto. So like mostly, I mean, alt weeklies are mostly gone now, but you know, they would do like movie listings and 
art shows downtown and things like that. So you, I sort of write, like I wrote movie reviews and I wrote little things about, I don't know, theater openings and this and that. And it's not, it's not gonna win you a Pulitzer Prize, but it's gonna get the ball rolling such that, you know, I think there's value when every time you go through the process of story conception, whether it be your own story idea or the editor says we need story X, Y, or Z, um, to going out to report it, to writing it, to having it edited, and then having it published. Every time you go through that cycle, you learn something. So like I said, by the time I, I, I graduated from college, I think I had like 80 or something like that, which is more than, more, more than you need. You don't need that much, but you want to have a decent selection because oftentimes what you'll get asked for in the newspaper world is give me your five best articles or give me your 10 best articles and if you only got five then you know which one your best five are um, but if you have 20 or you got 30 you have some to choose from and you can give a little bit of diversity so student papers uh, campus newspapers are, are, are an obvious place to go but I would also say go beyond the campus and um, and, and ask around and see who you can write for and um, you know compared to 20 years ago, you have a lot of online outlets as well that aren't bound by geography now. You don't have to be working for a Wisconsin outlet. You could write for, I don't know, I mean, these days, I've never tried, of course, but with Vox or Quartz or uh, Huffington Post or some of these other outlets, um, I, I don't know what the, what the parameters are. Maybe others can speak to that. But my point is just get as many reps as you can, um, because I think, I think you, you benefit from that. All right, 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 right is is what Jonathan says. Mike, what what advice would you have to students wanting to break into this field right now, and and what should they be doing? I think Jonathan Jonathan makes a, a very a very good point, but I, I would add a couple of things. Um, one is uh, uh, expertise matters. Uh, if you don't have vast journalism experience, but you have you know, mastered a, 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 an area, a region, a country, a language, uh, and all, and, and also a, 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 even you know, the, a, other kinds of specialization, uh, uh, nuclear weapons, human rights, international law, economics. Um, uh, the world is getting more and more complicated. And so somebody can say, okay, I haven't written dozens and dozens and dozens of articles, but I really know how arms control works. And I speak Chinese and have, you know, studied the country or whatever. That's one element. The other thing I would say is given the way the media world has changed, um, when I, like when I started at CNN, uh, you know, I was the reporter and I, I went out with a, a camera person and, and a producer, you know, and I wrote the story and narrated it but somebody else shot it, somebody else edited it, and so on. By the time I was leaving, uh, the, the days of like the two-person camera crew were disappearing, and uh, there was pressure on reporters to shoot their own video. The, the mantra at CNN was across all platforms. And so today, you're not just writing for a newspaper that somebody is going to pick up and hold. You're servicing a website that wants video, it wants audio, it wants uh, you know, presence on social media. And so I would say the other absolutely crucial thing here is uh, acquire some uh, technical skills, uh, learn how to shoot video, learn how to edit video, learn how to um, uh, learn how to work with audio, uh, learn Photoshop. Uh, the, 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 because because uh, in, in a multimedia world, uh, if, uh, if you can come in and say, I, I, I have the, the technicals, learn coding. So you can do stuff, you, know, you can post stuff on the internet. These things I think are absolutely essential now. You can't, I mean, uh, you can't just, just be a sort of, you know, a one skill person uh, anymore. You know, back when I started the editor edited film, which, which again brings us back to ancient history. Um, that's all the editor did. Um, today, you're, if you come in and say, I can be a one person operation because I can, I can, I can shoot, I can edit, and I've got the regional skills and so on. Uh, I may not have a huge collection of things that I've done, but these are the skills I can bring. That's gonna make you much more uh, employable to have these technical skills. And I think that's absolutely essential these days. 
Thank, thank you, Mike. And, and I, I think that is such great advice. And uh, e even though I'm not a journalist, I would just like to point out to my audience that I'm a historian, but I got my first real job in history because I knew how to do CSS and HTML. <laughs> and they wanted someone that they really wanted a web designer. If they could get a web designer who knew history, then, then that was good. So I think, I think that is really excellent advice, advice about trying to diversify your skills and, and probably no matter what field you're looking to get into. Uh, Elizabeth, what, what advice would you give someone looking to break into this field? With something that they can do, they can be doing right now. Um, I would say, again, cut out the white noise and focus on yourself. So what I mean by that is, you know, it's, it's not, it's not like something you should regard as negative focusing on yourself, but really focusing on like who you are, where, where your interests are, what you naturally gravitate to. So think of, for example, the books that you, you are naturally drawn to when, when you're at the local bookstore or browsing on Amazon, because they really provide a clue about the kind of journalism you want to pursue. So start with your interests first, and then also um, if you're ready to, you know, seriously pursue a career in journalism while still in school, um, you should be researching news organizations and publications and online magazines that you think would be interested in accepting your pitch, your story idea. So if you are still in school, freelancing is probably one of the few ways to get clips that you can include in your portfolio when you start applying for internships or jobs. Um, I completed the Dow Jones News Fund internship in multi-platform editing. So this goes back to what Mike was saying about, you know, you need to be, you need to have multiple skills. So newsrooms now just assume it's, you know, obviously there's still the print newspaper. I interned at the Minneapolis Star Tribune in Minnesota. And you know, we the the internship provided me experience with a traditional newspaper that was making the transition to multimedia and online news and constant updates and you know updates to breaking news. So um, the industry is transforming. So and the prof you know through internships like um, Dow Jones and also the internship I I completed with the Associated Press in Seoul. Um, you become professionalized. These internships give you structure. So I rec recommend both those programs. Um, professionalization provides you with structure. Um, I know a lot of a lot of journalists um, commit to freelancing throughout their career. Um, there's there are some journalists who never see the inside of a newsroom. But if if the professionalization and the structure and the networks are important to you. I, I advise you to apply to internships and apply early. Um, and of course, I've, I've mentioned conferences. Go to conferences that that you know maintain your interest. I'm a member of the Association of Asian Studies. I was a member of the Asian American Journalists Association. Um, there are other um, there are other great you know organizations where networking is possible. The National Press Club in Washington. Um, various force foreign pre foreign press correspondence groups in New York. Um, also, um, I've also noticed that um, groups like the International Journalist Network, um, they, they're providing a constant source of updates on internships and freelancing opportunities and fellowships uh, in journalism that you can apply for. So those are those are just some of the names I'd like to you know put out there. As for uh, essential skills. Um, I would say because you're in school and you've honed your research skills, your reading skills, um, and your critical thinking, um, what you what we need to, I mean, before you graduate, if you want to go into journalism, what you really need are uh, soft skills, people skills. Um, you have to be patient with sources. Sometimes people agree to speak to you and cancel or back out at the last minute. That's always disappointing. So it's important to not take things personally when that happens. So it's a precarious balance. Like um, on one hand, you have to have a thick skin, but you also have to um, display empathy and compassion for people so you can build trust with them. So it, it's not always easy, but that's, 
that, that those are some of my suggestions. All right, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank, that, that was really good advice. Write, 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 add new skills, focus on yourself. Um, and and this is, I, I think this is probably good advice for any number of careers. I know I always tell my students that writing is the most difficult thing I think any human being ever does. And the only way to get better at it is by doing it. You know, people aren't born great writers. It's, it, they're made, they transform themselves into great writers. Um, uh, our, our next question before um, we open it up for some questions from our attendees, what is the one thing that you wish you could have known about being a journalist before you entered this profession? So you've all been in this profession now for, for quite some time. So I'm, sure th I'm sure there's some aspects of it that are different from what you expected. Um, although maybe it is, maybe it's different in a good way. Maybe it's even much more enjoyable than, than you were imagining, Jonathan, when you were all the way back in high school and then undergrad. But if you could, if you could go back, you know, to, to yourselves as undergrads or graduate students, what do you wish you would have known about your careers so far at that point? What, what would you go back and tell yourself? And if we can, um, if we can hear from maybe Mike, Elizabeth, and then Jonathan. That's a sort of, it's an interesting question. I, I guess one thing that you don't really realize until, until you experience it is um, just how crazy the lifestyle can be. Um, you know, it looks exciting on the outside, but um, I think uh, the, there's a sense in which uh, you're, you're dealing with incredible stress and pressures. You're, you're not, you're, you don't control your life. Mo most journalists, you're, you're, you're at the mercy of events and the people plotting the coup or the earthquake taking place uh, doesn't care that it's your kid's birthday or your anniversary or you've just arrived for a desperately needed two week vacation. Um, all of which were uh, moments in my life that got ruined. <laughs> The call of news. Um, so there's that kind of pressure, which I don't think I really uh, appreciated. Um, and it, there's also just the, the, the pressure and stress of, of witnessing and experiencing some of the kind of stuff that you end up experiencing. I mean, obviously, it's different depending on where you are and what, what you're focusing on. Um, but you can find yourself in the middle of some pretty uh, dreadful or scary uh, or, or dangerous uh, situations. And so learning how to cope with that kind of stress and then being able, despite that, to uh, you know, take a step back and sit down and figure out how to explain what it is that you've just gone through in 800 words or, or in two minutes. Um, I would also say uh, uh, one, one of the things that, that, that I didn't appreciate as much is how hard it is to, uh, to write short. Uh, the, there's a famous saying from Mark Twain, the writer Mark Twain, he wrote a letter to a friend. He said, I apologize that this letter is so long. I haven't had the time to write you a short one um, because it's really hard when, when the editor says you only have a minute and a half, you only have 600 words in the paper. Um, so, so appreciating that, I think, in, uh, are, you know, these are just things that kind of, you don't really realize when you're, when you're, when you're thinking about it, that you need to be able to sort of have the constitution of somebody who can go through Marine Corps basic training and go without sleep and deal with pressure. All that being said, it's an absolutely fantastic career path, you get to have a ringside seat at history unfolding, you get to meet the most amazing people, um, you know, and, 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 you know, you see things that other people don't ever get to see, um, which is a great, a great gift. And if you can then communicate that to other people who aren't there, then I think you're doing an important, important service. So, uh, there's a lot of wear and tear, but it's an absolutely fantastic profession. I, would, I wouldn't be put off by it, but you know, if you want a nine to five job in your regular weekends and holidays, I'd suggest perhaps considering something else. All right, a, a, lot, of, a lot of wear and tear. Elizabeth, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? What would you go back and tell yourself if you could? I would, I would tell myself that this job comes with 
great responsibility. Um, and this is something I've been thinking deeply about recently because of the pandemic. And this is especially relevant to journalists who work in East Asia, who work, who write about East Asia. I think this is, this is an important lesson because when the pandemic hit last year, um, obviously um, a lot of, it drew a lot of media attention. Many people were covering it and it, it continues to be covered because we're still in the middle of this. It's not over. And we still don't know what's going to happen next, although thankfully there's the vaccine. But um, what I've realized is that while a journalism is, is requires great responsibility because not only are we holding people in power accountable, Uh, I, I think, Elizabeth, I think we've lost you. The pandemic, um, hate crimes targeting Asians and Asian Americans have skyrocketed, not just in the United States, but across you know the Western hemisphere. So this concerns me. And you know, I'm just personally of the opinion that the mu news media is not entirely innocent. Of, about this particular outcome. Um, I think we could have done things better. I'm very much, you know, responsible. I feel very much responsible as well. But I think we also need a better politics of coverage about Asia, about racialized others um, that does not invite xenophobia, racism, or sinophobia. So uh, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a difficult task, but I think it needs to be it needs to be addressed. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. We, we lost your mic for a minute there, but I, I, I think the substance of, of what you were saying was coming through. And, and I think um, as a scholar of US career relations uh, and, and all of us really, I think we spend time thinking about this, right? Especially when it comes to something like North Korea, um, you, you, you don't wanna sugarcoat the place at all. You want to be honest, but you also want to, to try to inform people about it in a constructive way. That's not just going to build on stereotypes that likely that they already have. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. How about, how about you, Jonathan? What would you yeah, tell no. yourself if you could? Yeah, I mean, I'll sort of highlight some of the good, some of the bad, but, um, but I'll start with the good, which is, um, you know, I've been asked the question before, and I'll give the answer I've given before, which is that um, you know, when you're, when you're a teenager or younger, I mean, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a baseball player, I wanted to be a rock star, I wanted to be a politician, I wanted to be a newspaper reporter, I didn't, you know, I mean, like, like a lot of kids, I don't know what it's like to be a baseball player, I don't know what it's like to be a rock star, but I can say that being a reporter is about as cool as I thought it would be. Um, it really is sort of like, like, as Mike was saying, you get to be at the front lines of history and you're often in the room or next to the room where things are happening or you're um you know i mean it, it just over the years just you, you're naturally gonna to, to to be in in those um great situations so um i don't know i that suddenly just popped into my head like oh yeah i was you know with the pope when the pope came to visit korea and that was kind of cool and um and I'll throw another shout out to Mike. He was, like, he was talking about meeting cool people. He met Kim Il Sung. I mean, how cool is that? So, I mean, that's just, I mean, cool may not be the right word, but but anyways, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, you know? I mean, journalists, uh, you know, you, you get invited into these places sometimes where you sort of wonder, what, what am I, wow, how, how did I get here, you know? Um, and, and, and the flip side of it, that's the reporting side and the writing side. I mean, I, I personally love that as well. I talked about getting a lot of reps in and I think I have gotten to that point where I love coming back to the newsroom with a notebook full of, you know, scribbles. And for me, I strap on my headphones and I turn on my music and I just sort of get into the zone. And um, when you've written enough, it just sort of becomes second nature. You don't have time for writer's block. You have that screen, but you have a ticking clock of two hours or three hours and you can't just say, well, sorry, I, I had writer's block. I couldn't turn in anything. You just, you just got to write. And I sort of love that. Um, and I love the adrenaline rush of that. So, you know, that's the good side. 
Um, and then sort of uh, piggybacking on what Elizabeth was saying, but just a little bit different too, is, is that, you know, I will say though that, you know, it's been, you know, 16 years for me in the industry. And I mean, I think the thing that's changed the most in the last couple of years um, has been how polarized the news environment has become. And when you're on Twitter frequently, as I am, you 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 see the you see the worst of it. You see it all the time, and uh, you know you get attacked. I mean, it's guaranteed you're going to be attacked. Uh, you're going to be attacked from all sides. In fact, I sort of think it's a good thing to be attacked from both sides. Um, you know, when I was in Korea, I would get attacked as a North Korea sympathizer. I would get you know attacked as a North Korea hater. Um, I you know you would sort of I, I've had you know, Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, go after me on Twitter and then suddenly the entire, you know, Trump world was, was, was attacking me online. And then I've had the socialists come and attack me. And actually the socialists are arguably fiercer, but they all come at you in different ways. And your phone can just sort of blow up for a couple of days because, um, you know, these days it's, it, it, it's, you know, I mean, I think for all of us, we really do try and strive for that ideal, uh, it may not exist, of trying to be neutral and trying to be fair and trying to be, um, you know, telling it like it is. Um, but as we all know, that's, that's, that's a really tough concept and nobody ever gets it right and nobody ever thinks you get it right. And so you'll hear about it a lot. So, you know, you do have to develop a thick skin um, far more than when I started 15 years ago when there wasn't social media i mean you would i would still get emails you'd get handwritten letters in the mail but um but now you get that feedback instantaneously and um and 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 it can be pretty harsh so i'd sort of put that all out there but one final thought is that there is a silver lining there and i think that it's really made me hyper 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 aware and hyper alert towards any sort of uh, partisanship in my head almost. Um, it's not to say we can't be human beings as reporters, we're allowed to have our views, um, but you need to be careful about how you express them. Um, I mean, my company is very clear, like we're not campaigning for anyone, we're not politically donating to anyone. It helps that I'm Canadian, so it at least pulls me out of the US bipartisan sort of fighting. I could just sort of say, look, it's, it's you know, I'm Canadian, so, um, but but beyond that, um, you really, it, it's, it's made me very keenly uh, sensitive to the role that we have. And it's made me careful about how I phrase everything from um, every sentence in a story to um, tweets and everything else. You just want to make it so that you're really just coming down the middle of the road as much as you can, as, as, as naive as that sounds, that, that's sort of our goal. Thank you for that, Jonathan. And, and yeah, it is it is a lot easier to actually reach out, and it's a lot easier than writing a letter to the editor used to be. And you can you can generally find who wrote whatever story you're you're reading and and write them. And I discovered this myself recently when I there was a career based journalist who I thought got something wrong, and I wrote them, and I was shocked they responded to me in about five minutes, and we had a nice exchange back and forth, and and. I think that's got to be one of the joys, but also one of the curses when you end up interacting with with maybe the 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 less polite and more aggressive sorts. Um, so so we have a we have a question here, um, which is, and I think it's it's in response to what many of you have said about writing and about getting um, you know writing as much as possible. But it if you have limited time and resources in terms of writing and preparing clips for the job market, do you pursue hot and trendy topics or things more in tune with your personal interests? Uh, it says, if you wanna cover local news, are you better off um, when you hit the job market to send clips about climate change and nuclear policy or about the local high school team or our football team? So yeah, uh, right, right, right. But you only have limited time. So, so where would you put your energies? Does anyone wanna, wanna take that? I can go ahead, Mike. You know, um, I think it partly depends on what it is you are, ha what you have to say about the issue. I mean, it, um, and I would just step one step back. One thing I think, if if you're if you're 
for people who are interested in, in, in a career in journalism is really uh, uh, become, make yourself a, 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 a critical and sophisticated consumer of news. This is sort of the indirect answer here, but read as much as you can. And when you read uh, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, when you, when you watch CNN or NBC or whatever, don't just sit there and passively read it and say, oh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, make a habit of breaking down a story that you're in. The next time you, you, you read the story with Jonathan's byline, analyze it. What was the lead? What quotes did he use? How was it written? Um, I, I, I'm a, like Jonathan, I'm a sports fan. I don't, I don't know about you, Elizabeth, but I'm, I'm a big sports fan. And I love reading the sports pages because some of the best writing in journalism is done by sports writers. It's absolutely brilliant. So you could bring something to, you know, to, to writing about a high school football team that's absolutely wonderful read. Uh, so I would say, you know, one important step is try to identify for yourself who you think the best writers and reporters are um, out there. Um, at CNN, there was a guy uh, who died a couple of years ago named Richard Blystone, uh, who when he died, my, my old friend Christian Amanpour called him the poet laureate of TV news. And if you uh, uh, go see if you can find any of his clips online. This guy, every piece he wrote, whether it was about animals in the London Zoo or the war in Iraq, was a piece of poetry. And so I think you can really, you know, if you study and absorb this and then try and think, what can I bring to this and how can I write it? And, and, and I think that more than this specific topic is really helpful in terms of showing how you can how you can write and, and convey something so that it resonates with the, with the person who's reading it or watching it. Oh, thank you, Mike. Uh, Elizabeth or Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I, oh, yeah, Elizabeth, you go first. Oh, I just want to say I completely agree with, with Mike. It, it, is about, it is about what you bring to this. This, this is a very unique occupation because, you know, you're not producing identical products every day. Um, even investment banking, when you're working on a trading floor, um, you're, you're doing the same function every day. And in journalism, you're always, re you're always back to square one. You're starting with a whole new topic. I mean, in the sense that you have to create something that was completely different, that is different, that has to be different than anything you've created before in the past. So, um, you know, when you want to, when you're, when you're, you know, facing a dilemma about which, which article, which clip to send, um, go with the one that reflects, you know, your strengths. Um, so, and yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I mean, I'll, I'll take a slightly different tack here. I mean, I, I've had a very generalist sort of career and I'm generally a fan of um, the generalist approach, um, meaning, um, you know, I, 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 you know, we've mentioned a few times, I mean, I love sports, but I've never been a sports writer and I've never um, done anything like that. Um, in fact, I sort of have followed the winds wherever they've sort of taken me in a certain sense. And I think one thing that you want to be able to bring as a journalist is the ability to be to parachute into a totally unfamiliar situation and to be able to quickly figure out what's going on. Now you could it could literally be parachute in in a disaster zone or something. There's just been an earthquake or something like that. You're not an earthquake reporter, but suddenly you're in there and you got to figure it out. And you don't have 24, 48 hours to think about it and, and ruminate on how to approach it. You, you're in there, right? So um, so I mean. The formative examples for me, I mentioned I spent three years in New York and I was writing about the stock market. Now, I, 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 I was not interested in the stock market. I didn't become a stock market reporter because I really wanted to write about the S&P 500. It was because that was the job that was open. And I'm glad I did it because for three years, I immersed myself in that world and I learned to talk to people in a way that at first I, they could probably tell immediately that I knew nothing about what I was writing about. But 
with reps and with time, I could talk to money managers and I could talk to them about the stock market such that for the rest of my life now, I can talk to stock market people and sound intelligent and, and actually mostly get what they're talking about now. Um, my first assignment, I recall, as an intern at the Star Ledger in Newark, New Jersey, was at that time, um, I was the young intern and Harry Potter number four was coming out in bookstores or something like that. And they needed someone to go and write about Harry Potter four. So I camped out at the bookstores and I got to know all of the people in the Harry Potter world. I had read books one and two, but I'm not a Harry Potter like fan really, but I had to read the other books and I had to like quickly become an expert in Harry Potter in order to talk to the booksellers and the parents and the teachers and the kids and everything else. And I ended up writing three or four stories about that. And, um, and when I went to Korea, my initial job was to write about Samsung. That was not something I ever thought I wanted to do. I never thought I needed to know about semiconductors or whatever, but now I, I can talk to semiconductor people and I'm glad I did because now semiconductors are really important in global geopolitics. So, I mean, I think, I think um, you know, totally what Elizabeth was saying, you know, um, you want to know what you care about and as much as possible, of course, if, if you can find a job that will let you be able to really get to explore and to live the stuff that you love, that's, that's great. But I would also make the opposite case that sometimes you don't necessarily know what you love. I, I wouldn't say that I've, you know, become a lover of the stock market or of the semiconductor industry or something like that, but I'm so glad that that's just what the job openings led me to and that I had to quickly figure out what that world was like because each one of these is a different world and and they all have their their politics and they all have their dynamic at work you know and, and you need to quickly figure out what's going on in that world thank you thank you for that for for that response all those responses um i, I think i might i think we have time for probably just one more question and i think i might exercise my right as a moderator to ask it and and it's one that that's been on my mind a lot recently and, and that's that recent tensions between the US and China have resulted in a, a number of um, unfortunate developments in my opinion, um, especially recently in both countries moving to limit access to journalists from the other countries. So limiting uh, Chinese journalists in the US, limiting American journalists access in China. Um, I'm wondering if you see this and similar developments uh, limiting opportunities in this field going forward or perhaps paradoxically do these tensions actually lead to more opportunities because there is so much interest in china because there is so much interest and we north korea obviously does not have a very different relationship with journalism but uh, it does interest does this, do these kind of controversies actually draw interest or is is us china relations deteriorating to the point where it's actually going to be maybe limiting opportunities for people wanting to join this profession in the future Who would, who would like to start? Jonathan, what, what you look like you're you're nodding your head. Well, I well I I I'm, I'm I do sort of feel like I'm at the center of it in a in a sense. I mean, we've had most of our China bureau expelled over the past uh, year by the Chinese government, so we've lost a lot of boots on the ground. Uh, what we've done instead is we've had a lot of our reporters get kicked out of the mainland and continue to report on China, but from um, off mainland postings, uh, for example, in Singapore in New York, uh, in Hong Kong, in, in some cases, and Taiwan increasingly. So, um, you know, and, um, and, and, and again, I'm gonna take it back to Assignment China, which is a documentary everyone ought to watch. But watching that and, and just recalling how the initial era of US journalism of the People's Republic of China was conducted, it was all done offshore. And, when I was watching that documentary for the first time, I was sitting in Seoul and trying to write about North Korea. And it felt so similar to be sitting in, because all the, all the China watchers were in Hong Kong and trying to you know, read their People's Daily and figure out what was going on um, you know, at, uh, you know, around now and in his inner circle. And sitting in Seoul, we do the same thing. And we look at the Nodong Shinmun and we try to figure out what's happening in Kim, Kim Jong-un's inner court. And, um, you know, I hope we're not going back to an era like that, um, but um, certainly directionally, it feels like we are heading in that direction. Um, obviously, um, there are many issues between the US and China, or you could say uh, the Western world and China these days. Um, and I, you know, 
I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know where things are heading, but um, I'm glad to still be here. But I, 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 I feel, I feel the, I feel the constraints uh, growing. And again, um, just with the knowledge of the history of the last 60, 70 years of U.S. China journalism in my head, I know there's a precedent for it. So, so um, I, I will rule it out. I just, I hope it doesn't go in that direction. But, but we'll have to see. If, if I could just add something, uh, I, I mean, I think there is this odd um, sort of coming full circle feeling, um, uh, which is something that in this, this film, Assignment China, which is all the episodes are on, online, if people are interested in taking a look. Um, but it's different in a way now, because uh, back then, when journalists were kicked out of China, when the communist Western journalists, American journalists, um, uh, you know, you were looking at a sort of very secretive society and very hard to penetrate. Today, uh, China is much e more engaged in the world. There are Chinese companies, individuals, businesses, students, investments all over the world, and that provides openings. Uh, so I think there is a there is room for people who are who are interested in China. Uh, to write about China and, and learn stuff that tells you things about where China is going without necessarily being there. But what is tragic here is that, you know, the ability to sort of sniff the air and see what it looks and feels like that is so central to so much good journalism. Um, we're losing that. And I, I, I'm very concerned, like Jonathan, that we're, 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 we're going in a, in a, in a bad direction on this. Um, but I think that makes it more important, not less important, that we try to find other ways to make sense of China and learn about China and communicate about China uh, because it's going to be such an increasingly important part of everybody's lives around the world. Thank you, Mike. Elizabeth, do you have any anything to add on this, on, on opportunities uh, going forward? Um, do these do these tensions do they create new opportunities or are you worried that maybe some are being closed off um i mean i'm not sure because my focus is primarily on the korean peninsula however um if i could offer some insight because of my extensive coverage of north korea i would probably be interested in finding out as an investigative journalist how China is using the international news media to, to artificially create these tensions. I think they're doing all, they, they've just done so much, you know, the Chinese government has done so much in the past year, including but not limited to, you know, military tensions with Taiwan, uh, the ongoing crackdown in Hong Kong, and, and, and they see how this affects um, the international community. Um, and, you know, in, in my coverage of North Korea, I do find evidence that North Korea uses people like us to get a message through. But I also think the, the bigger, bigger issue is what they don't like to highlight. Um, for example, what is the Chinese government's relationship with its domestic citizenry? Um, do they ever fear the possibility of a breakup like the Soviet Union? I mean, there's 55, sorry if I'm wrong, but there are multiple minority groups in China. Xinjiang is obviously a source of tensions. It's like, what are they trying to hide? So I think when controversy strikes, we need to look beneath that as well. So that might be an opportunity for journalists. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan Chang of the Wall Street Journal, Elizabeth Shim of United Press International, and Mike Chinoy of USC, uh, but formerly of CNN for many decades. It's been a wonderful discussion. I thank you so much for sharing your advice and your experiences with our students and with whoever might be finding this in the future. Thank you again to all of the attendees. If you are interested, um, please visit or please register for the fourth event 
in this series. I put a link to our page in the chat, or you can find it on both of the websites for the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin, and also the East Asian Studies Center at The Ohio State University. Thank you very much to all of you. Have a good evening.